Hey everybody, it's time for me to wrap up my June reading. I had a fantastic reading month in June. Actually, the last few months have been very, very good, and I cannot complain. But I have a huge stack of books here that I cannot wait to tell you all about. So let's get started. Hi everybody and welcome back to my channel. It's Russell with Ink and Paper Blog. How are you all doing today? As always, I hope you're happy. I hope you're healthy. I hope you're safe. And of course, I hope you're reading an amazing book or two or three or four. Um, I have to say the weather has turned. It is a little less warm here in Northern California. We can actually have the windows open. The air doesn't have to be on. Work is crazy as always, but hey, it's going along. But my reading has really been a highlight. I have been reading some fantastic books lately that um, I cannot wait to tell you all about. So let's get started. Get out that pen, get out that paper, get out that Goodreads. However, you keep track of your TBR. If you are so able, please order one or two or three of these books from your local independent bookstore. I think this whole stack all of these books are already out, so you can get your hands on them. If you're a library user, get your library to get you a copy as soon as possible. So we're going to start today with some graphic novels that I read in sort of the middle of the month, but I wanted to kick them off because they were just very, very good. The first one is Heartstopper by Alice Oseman, and this is actually volume four in the series. I have already reviewed volumes one through three, one through three, one through three, a uh, tough word there for a second, um, and volume four just came out. Got to thank Ryan over at Read by Ryan because he lent me um, this one, and he actually has lent me all of them, and I just adore this series. This is a uh, collection of graphic novels about the relationship between Nick and Charlie. It is like a teenage gay love story, and it's got all of those warms and cute things about new love and the insecurities of it. But it also deals with some very, like, difficult topics that a lot of teens and a lot of gay teens, a lot of just, you know, teens across the board deal with um, eating disorders, self-harm, insecurity, depression, family issues. But Alice Oseman does it in such a way that there's always a brightness to the end. Like at the end of it, you always sort of feel warm and fuzzy and you just really are rooting for Nick and Charlie to make it. And I just love it. The art, by the way, is just like simply adorable. And it's all that young love stuff, like texting and, you know, just waiting for that other person to text you back. I mean, when I was younger and falling in love, there was no text, but you know what I mean. Um, and it's just absolutely adorable. But it does deal with those topics in such a wonderful way, um, making it just such a complete little story. So that's Heartstopper by Alice Oseman, and this is volume four in the series. I highly, highly recommend all of them. The next one is another one that Ryan read, uh, lent me, and that's Flamer by Mike Carato. And this is out from Henry Holt. Oh, I should say that this is out from Hodor, but I think this is the UK version. I think that Ryan gets all of them from the UK because, you know, he wants to get them as soon as possible. Um, I'm not sure yet if volume four is out in the US. Okay, and I just dropped that book. So hold on one second. Cannot have that on the floor. I don't want to get anyone mad at me. So the next book we're going to talk about is Flamer by Mark Mike Carato. And again, this is out from Henry Holt. And this is another fantastic graphic novel. I, I have to show you some of the art. Um, some of my favorite stuff is just, it's just so beautiful here. I don't know. These are just some of the pages, but it's just great. And this is the young, a story of a young boy named Aiden who goes to summer camp. And while he's there, he meets another young boy and he starts to sort of have feelings, sexual awakening, sort of that kind of stuff. But he's dealing with also issues of racism, issues of 
insecurity, issues of self-doubt. And then he meets someone and he thinks that there's something there and then, you know, stuff happens. And it deals with some dark stuff, but it is also extremely hopeful. And it's about just young boys learning about one themselves and one another. And it's just it's so good. It's so good. Um, I mean, it does. this one definitely made me a little bit sadder at times. Um, and then by the end, I was pretty darn happy to have read it. Um, and I highly, highly recommend it. I love a good graphic novel. It's just so, so good. So, so beautiful. I mean, there's just like these beautiful pictures. Like the, the use of color is just so profound. When it is used on a black and white space, this sort of flame, it just sort of adds this tension, but also this cleanliness. You'll get it when you when you read it. So that's Flamer by Mike Carato. This is out from Henry Holt, and I highly, highly recommend. I feel like today I'm going to highly, highly recommend a lot of books, so forgive me in advance. The next book we're going to talk about is a little slim sci-fi novella called Hard Reboot. This is by Django Wexler, and this is out from Tor.com. And this is a very... Um, compact little story. So basically what we have is we have a scholar that comes from um, off of Earth. So basically Earth has been destroyed in a lot of ways and it has really become just sort of an artifact with people left on it that just can't afford to get off. And there are three levels of people that have escaped. There's, um, I think they call them, I gotta remember, ones, twos, and threes. Ones are the people who just got off the planet Earth early. They had the money, they had the clout, they got out. Twos are just people who had the money and they were able to get out. Threes are the ones that came later and sort of have been always working and sort of making up for the fact that they never had the money to get off the planet in one or two. Does that make sense? Our main character is a scholar. She is a three. She comes back to Earth where um, there's all of this sort of um, debris and degradation and she comes to study the planet. She's a historian and one of the things that goes on on, the, on Earth are these robot fights and these ginormous robots from the past go into a ring and just attack each other and she winds up getting coerced into making a bet which leads her on this entire journey where she has to sort of stop what has happened before people find out and she is sort of punished by the school that has brought her there. And she meets a young pilot, a young woman who is just trying to get off the planet herself. There's romance, there's queer love, there's a little bit of, you know, it's a little bit violent, a little bit tension, a little bit fantastic. And it's just, it's a very good little story. You'll read it, you'll read it fast, and you'll want to go back to the world. You'll want to see the characters again. You hope that um, Django Wexler is going to write a sequel because you really want to know what happens. Um, and in the meantime, in the interim, as all that's going on, you have giant robots fighting each other to the death. There you go. So that's Hard Reboot by Django Wexler, and this is out now from Tor.com. I hope that was enough to get you all to buy that. Um, someone asked me in the comments where I'm from because I yo I use you all, you all a lot. So I try really, really hard not to use the phrase you guys. Um, uh, I have had some feedback actually in my professional life about the term you guys uh, years and years ago. And so I have tried really hard to train myself not to use that phrase, though it is very popular to use. So I use you all. So, and I'll sometimes say y'all just because it comes out naturally. Um, but that is why I say you all, if you have ever questions why. Um, the next book is one of the books that was highlighted in my Big Names New Books series. I just uh, did that video. That was the last video. But this book is freaking brilliant. And that's The Living Sea of Waking Dreams by Richard Flanagan, just in case you didn't see that video. This is uh, Richard Flanagan won the Booker Prize for his book, I always get it wrong, The Narrow Road to the Deep North. Um, and this book is very different than that, but just as brilliant. Um, this is the story of a young, uh, a woman, a middle-aged woman, I want to say her name is Anna, and her mother is, is basically dying. She's in hospital. Um, she's ill. She just continues to get more and more ill. The hospital is basically saying, you have to let her go, but she has two brothers, one who wants to let her go, and the other one who's sort of the more dominant personality that just can't seem to get 
to the idea of being without his mother, so continues to push medicine to keep her alive. And so that is part of the story, dealing with the loss of your mother, the dealing with not wanting her to go, so do you make her suffer more for your own sort of sense of self? In addition, Anna is mysteriously finding parts of her body missing. So it's a finger that starts and then a knee happens, but no one else really seems to notice. And it becomes this idea of loss of self as well. What happens when parts of you, who you are, start to disappear? And then she starts to notice it on others, and she's sort of taking that into uh, consideration as she sort of deals with her life, with her son, um, her partner, and all of that. In addition, there's this layer of the fact this takes place in Australia and Tanzania. There's a lot of fires going on. A lot of that beautiful nature in Australia is being destroyed. And there's that loss. So the book is looking at loss in all of these different layers. And the book is trying to ascertain as we lose things like this and we start to lose ourself as the world moves forward and the and the sort of the planet we're on is being lost is there hope and that's sort of what the book will sort of make you think about and talk about so that's the living sea of waking dreams by richard flanagan this is out in the u.s from Knopf, and i have to thank them for that finished copy i love that that probably will be in my top 10 reads of the year Okay, we are going to go in a completely different direction right now. And we are going to talk about Yes, Daddy by Jonathan Parks Ramage. Ramage, is that, am I saying that right? I'm sorry if that is incorrect, Jonathan. And this is a debut novel, and this is one crazy ride. So we have a young man who wants to be a playwright, currently working as a waiter in New York City. He has concocted in his head this plan to meet this famous playwright and sort of become his boy toy. And so this guy can sort of become his boyfriend so he can sort of utilize all of the money and the prestige. And he sort of made this whole plan. However, that goes horrifically wrong when it happens just the way he sort of wants it to. But you find out very quickly that this older gentleman who named Richard is domineering, violent, aggressive, degrading, and basically is turning these young boys into sort of not only sl sex slaves, but also like slaves of this compound he, li he has in the Hamptons. This book has major trigger warnings for um, sexual abuse and rape, if that is not your thing. Um, this book could be difficult for you, but it is done in such a way that it adds to the power of these young boys' story. What I think is absolutely brilliant about this book, and I'm not ruining anything, is the book starts in a courtroom, and our main character has been called as a witness against Richard, the man he winds up having the re or had the relationship with, in a rape trial. And he's been brought in sort of as the key witness to sort of put this guy away. And on the stand, something happens and he just can't do it. And he lies. He says that none of this ever happens. Why is this brilliant? So Jonathan sets us up in the first chapter to almost, I don't want to say hate, but have very strong feelings about the main character. You don't trust him any longer, but now he's your narrator. Now he's your telling your story. I, it's a brilliant, brilliant strategic move on Jonathan's part. And there's a lot of ups and downs with the characters, with the, the young boys and the rich men and the taking advantage of. And you're, you just want them to be free, but you understand in a lot of ways the allure of this money. When you've not had money, when you've not had stability, what are you willing to do? When do you say it's too much? How do you get away? Do you ever truly leave? So much to talk about in this book. So fascinating. Such a fast read. Um, yeah, I really, really, really liked it. Um, and it is not my normal type of read, but I found um, Jonathan to be the kind of writer that made me think about things in a very different way. So that's Yes, Daddy by Jonathan Parks Ramage. And I apologize, Jonathan, I'm saying Ramage. Um, and if that's incorrect, I apologize. And this is out from HMH Books. And you can get your hands on it right now. 
I highly, highly recommend it if you want something totally different than what I normally recommend, but I tell you it's worth it. Okay, now is a, gosh, I am really taking y'all around, around the world today because now we're going to talk about Cynthia Ozick's Antiquities, which is a completely different type of book. Um, I want to start by saying I love Cynthia Ozick. I have, I would probably put The Shawl, which is a, sort of a novella short story, um, is one of the favorite things I've ever read, um, ever. Um, I think she's absolutely brilliant. I think there's a lot of really good stuff in this book, but in some ways it didn't work for me. So what we have is we have this um, older gentleman, I believe he's in his 70s. He has sat down to sort of write a memoir or a collection of memoirs about this school, this um, private school that he was a student at and he is now on the board of trustees. The school has been closed for some time. But there's sort of a group of them, seven or eight of them, of these trustees that sort of live on the campus now as their lives sort of come to a close. And as he starts to write about this, it really becomes a focus on a young boy that he met while at school. And that boy is always treated differently. I'm not going to tell you why, because I think that's part of the narrative gift that Cynthia Ozick gives us as she sort of pieces those pieces to pieces those parts of the puzzle together. Um, but as he writes the story, we learn more about him. We learn about his relationship with his son. We learn about his relationship with the other trustees. And we learn about sort of his past. But we really learn about how formative this relationship with this young boy who was treated poorly is. Um, there was just, this book is just a little too short for me. There was a couple of threads that I just didn't know why or understand so much. Um, having this sole narrator from a memoir perspective didn't give me sort of that global view that I needed to sort of have the punch. But that being said, Cynthia is a, Ozick is a beautiful writer. I would recommend this book. I think that she does some really great stuff in it. I just wanted a little bit more from it. Um, and I just love her other stuff more. So it seems like it's weird to say that it's, you know, in comparison to others, her other works, this wasn't my favorite. But in the same time, if you've never read anything from her, I think you would get a lot out of this book. So that's Antiquities by Cynthia Ozick. And this is also out from Knopf. I bought this at my local independent bookstore, Books Inc. And um, yeah, it was very nice to go there and get it. The next book I'm going to tell you about is an oldie. Um, but I run a book club for a group of people I work with where we read books about um, diversity and inclusion and all that kind of stuff as we try and we talk about them. And the book we were currently reading is Boy Erased, A Memoir of Identity, Faith, and Family by Gerard Conley. And this has been out for some time. It's also a movie. I think it has Nicole Kidman and Rich Russell Crowe in it. Um, and the young boy, I can totally see his face and I'm totally blanking on his name, but he is a superstar actor. Um, and I apologize. But Boy Erased is a memoir about a young man who is uh, goes to college, comes out, you know, finds out he's gay, um, has he is a victim of sexual assault, sort of turns him away from who he is. He is raised in a very religious fa family. His father is a pastor, uh, pastor. Pastor is a completely different word, pastor. Um, and he's been raised in that family, and his family decides to put him into conversion therapy. And he goes there and he meets sort of this group of all these people. And it is fascinating how this organization, I, I'm going to call it an organization because I think it does a disservice to religious groups to say that it is a religion. Um, it's an organization that sort of clumps together homosexuals, pedophiles, people with other sexual proclivities and sort of lumps them together as curable by finding their way to God. And that is the story that we find here. Ger um, Ger Gerard is sort of pushed through that, but it is difficult and hard and he's he really changing. He meets someone there, the feelings are strong, but there's a lot of internalized homophobia being taught to these young people and they're being taught basically to hate a part of who they are um and it has a lot to do with his relationship with his mother it has a lot to do with definitely a very very difficult relationship with his father and um how that all changes over time 
Um, and yeah, I really, really, really loved this book. Um, I saw a lot of myself in it because, you know, being a gay man in my 40s, um, when I was coming out, there was a lot of this sort of dialogue going around. Just don't be gay. Just change who you are. It is a choice to be that way. And this book sort of hit me in a lot of those soft spots. It's a really easy read. You can definitely fly through it. It is beautifully written. Um, and in the same time, it just, it sort of will make your heart ache if you've ever known someone who wishes they were different just because they hate being pointed out that they are different all the time. Um, you'll sort of see a connection with this in a, long, a lot of ways. So that's Boy Erased, A Memoir of Identity, Faith, and Family by Gerard Conley. This is out from Riverhead Books. Of course, it's in paperback. It's been out for a few years now. Finally, I'm going to give you guys the summer read. If you are looking for something fun and cheerful and hopeful and slightly sad but lovely and laugh out loud funny, you have to read Gunkle by Stephen Rowley. Now, Stephen Rowley wrote um, Lily and the Octopus, which I know everybody loved. I actually have not read it. I have it on my shelf, signed by Stephen Rowley. I'm a huge fan. But I read the editor and I loved the editor. So I was so, so excited when this one arrived in the mail from Putnam. So thank you so much, Putnam. This is the story of a, of, a, of a gay uncle, which if you don't have any gay uncles in your world, um, they are often called gunkles. And um, what has happened is his best friend, who is also married to his brother, who's passed away from a very long fight with illness. And he goes home to her funeral for the first time. Now, he has lived in Palm Springs for a long time. He is sort of a reclusive, formerly famous actor. He was on TV. People knew who he was. And then some stuff happened. He lost a loved one. He lost a partner. And he sort of has closed off. He goes home, I think it's to Connecticut, um, to the funeral. And his brother admits to have really become addicted to narcotics, to drugs to help him get through this whole situation and asks him to take his niece and nephew home with him and take care of him. And he, the father, is going to go to rehab in, in Rancho Mirage, which is right next to Palm Springs. That being said, I used to live out in this area, so it was super fun to see all of these places um, and know everywhere that Stephen Rowley was talking about, even on the trips to LA. Um, and what happens is this is a book where this Gunkel takes care of his niece and nephew and help them through their their sadness and their trauma. They get a little dog that is adorable and he puts up a Christmas tree. It just it's just lovely. And at the same time, it is hilarious. There is a discussion at the beginning of this book about brunch that had me crying. It was so funny. But it's also tender and sweet. And it's about a relationship between an uncle and his niece and his nephew and how that sort of gets everyone to heal in a lot of ways. Um, it is super fun. It is it's fantastic. I promise you, if you read it, you will enjoy it. It is a book to read by the pool. It's a book to read on the couch. It's a book to read anytime. Stephen Rowley would tell you, read it in a caftan. But he would also say that this book is an homage to family and love and getting through it all together. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. So that's The Gunkel by Stephen Rowley, and this is out from Putnam. You can get your hands on it right now. I'm going to try, as I always do, to put these books in a pile so I can hold them up for you. And you know, half the time we are successful and half the time I drop them everywhere. So let's hope. Okay, there we go. That is the stack of books. All of these are worth your time in one way or another, I absolutely promise. As always, if you are a turn subscriber, I could not do this without you. Thank you very, very much. And I need to shave my mustache. <laughs> and if you are new to my channel, I totally, totally hope you come back for more. Please subscribe. I really love having you here. As always, I encourage you to read, local, um, read globally, shop locally. And until next time, I wish you happy reading. Bye, everyone.